I want to begin my talk today with a statement, a statement that guides me in everything I do, in my teaching, in my research, and in my practice of design. And that statement is that I believe in the power of design. And as Spider-Man tells us, with great power comes great responsibility. So I believe in our responsibility as designers. When you think about it, designers have an incredible control over our everyday lives. They make decisions for us. They decide how we interact with our cities, how we interact with a room like this, how we communicate with one another, how we work in our offices and learn in our schools. And that is an incredible power. But I also believe with this power and responsibility, we have an obligation to make sure that we're designing for everyone. And today I want to talk to you about the fact that we're failing to do so. And to explain this failure, I want to do a little exercise with everyone, if you guys don't mind. I want everyone in the audience to first raise their hand. All right. Now I want anyone in the audience who wears glasses, contacts, or is visually impaired to put their hands down. I want anyone who has a hearing impairment or wears a hearing aid or doesn't hear very well in all situations to please put their hands down. I want anyone who's ever been in a wheelchair or broken their leg and used crutches or has to walk with a cane to put your hands down. And I want anyone who's ever been nine months pregnant and had difficulty walking up a flight of stairs like I did when I was nine months pregnant to put your hands down. Now I want anyone who is under the age of 18 to put your hands down. And anyone above the age of 35 to put their hands down. And now I'm going to have to say something that I always hate to do, but I want all the women to put their hands down. And finally, I want those remaining men among us who are shorter than 1 meter 82 to put their hands down. That leaves us with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people in a room of almost 1,000. Statistically, we call this a minority. The ironic thing is that we as designers are trained to design for those ten men, not for all of you who put their hands down. We're trained to design for the perfectly capable, able, walking, talking, seeing, speaking, moving, tall man. That is the standard we're trained to design for, and not for everyone else. So what I want to talk to you about today is what we as designers need to start doing for all of you who put your hands down. And not only that group, but an even smaller group, this group which we call the marginal the marginal of the marginal, those people that very, very few designers before the work that we've done have actually thought about how to design for. And I'm going to do this by telling you a story. And this story begins with myself as a young mother, my daughter's here in the audience, when she was a newborn child, and it weaves with us through many exciting places like Cape Town, South Africa, London, the WHO in Geneva, the United States, and even the United Nations, and ends up with us here today in this talk at TEDx in Cairo. The story began in 2002, when I was asked to design Egypt's first center for individuals with autism. I was approached by a group of parents who were fed up. They couldn't find the appropriate support that their children needed anywhere in Egypt, so they decided to create their own. At the time, I was working on my PhD on a completely different topic. And when they asked me to do this task, being a very good student, I went to my reference books, and I was expecting to find a chapter, just like the chapters on wheelchair accessibility, on hearing impairment, and on visual impairment, and how to design for them, on how to design for autism. There was absolutely nothing. Not here, not anywhere in the world. No architect had looked at how to design for individuals with autism. So I threw away two years of work, 
I called my very brave advisor, who agreed to give me two months to come up with a new proposal, and I decided to dedicate my doctoral dissertation to finding the answer to that question, what is an appropriate architecture for autism? I worked with a group of parents that had originally approached me, a very brave group of parents who established the Advanced Society, which is the Middle East's, one of the Middle East's first dedicated societies to provide educational support for individuals with autism. And we set up a group of very interesting experiments in the classroom in their schools. And the experiments looked at the effect of what we call spatial sequencing, which I'll talk about in a moment. We looked at how to create predictability through this spatial sequencing. We experimented with how we can control the acoustical environment in speech and language therapy, and what the effects were of creating escape spaces in classrooms. And the results of these experiments became the first evidence real evidence anywhere in the word, world that architecture can actually help autism. And the best performing students in this experiment, their attention span almost doubled, their response time was cut in half, and their behavioral temperament was greatly improved. To help you understand how important the concept of an architecture for autism is, because there is an expectation that this is a very small group of people, the Centers for Disease Control in the United States currently estimate, quite conservatively, that one in 68 children fall within the spectrum of autism. And just to give you an idea of that, what that number actually means, that means that there will be more children with autism diagnosed this year than those with AIDS, cancer, and diabetes all combined. That means that in the next 10 minutes, by the time my talk is over, 50 children will have been born somewhere on this planet that will grow up to join the hundreds of millions of people that suffer from autism worldwide. Although we don't keep up-to-date statistics in Egypt, there's been an informed estimate that about 1% of our children fall within this spectrum of autism. And it's important to understand that autism is a spectrum and doesn't affect everyone the same way. And it was only first defined in 1943 and didn't become a recognized diagnosis until the 1980s. But it's, it's characterized by three main things. Challenges with social interaction, difficulty with verbal and nonverbal communication, and repetitive and routine behavior. But like I said, autism is, is a spectrum. And not everyone has the same challenges, and not everyone is as severely affected by it. As they say in the autism community, if you've met one person with autism, you've met just one person with autism. Researchers are still trying to unlock and discover what exactly causes autism, but there's a lot of evidence that tells us the root of the challenges lies in the sensory input. It tells us that autism is a different way of perceiving the world around us, and that the challenges are a result of how individuals with autism see smell, touch, and feel the world in a way that's differently than you and I typically would. To help you understand this, I want you to play another little game with me. I want you to imagine a world where the light is too bright, where every color is too agitating, where every pattern is too distracting. And then I want you to imagine if you were not able to ignore the background sound of the air conditioning buzzing, or the fluorescent lights buzzing in the background, or the sound of the people walking around you, or the whizzing by of the cars outside on the street, or even the rustle of the fabric of the person sitting next to you. Imagine what kind of world that would be. And imagine that that the, is the world that you were put in from a very, very young age. And imagine that very, very people understood you and understood why it was you were behaving in the way that you were behaving as a result of this different way that you were sensing the world and understanding the sights, smells, and sounds that it was throwing at you. So about over a decade of work, I've been doing this since 2002, 
I recently, in 2013, published the Autism Aspects Design Index. I worked with various schools around the world, in the Emirates, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, here in Egypt, and even in the United States. And we came up finally with what we call the Autism Aspects Design Index, which has been recognized and presented worldwide and received international awards. Aspects is basically a set of seven guidelines. It's not like code, like the type of code you would see for designing for other disabilities, but it's a set of criteria, a catalyst for thinking about how we have to design for autism. The first criteria is acoustics. And I'll never forget an email that I received in response to a three-page survey I sent to parents asking them about how their children were responding to the physical environment. One woman from New York sent me a three-word response, acoustics, acoustics, acoustics. So very early on in the research, it became clear that acoustics was an important part of our experiment. The second criteria is spatial sequencing. And again, early on in my research, a brilliant therapist told me the best way to teach a child with autism is to work with what they love, work with what they know, and work with what they focus on which is typically their obsessive routine. So spatial sequencing adopts that idea and builds on an autistic individual's love of routine and creates predictability and tells us to organize our spaces in a way that follows the normal daily routine of that child. They now call this affinity therapy, if anyone's interested in reading more about it. The third criteria in aspects is escape. An escape essentially tells us as designers to create a safe place for individuals with autism to go to when they feel overwhelmed and overloaded, just like we did a few minutes ago with all the sounds and sights and lights around us. It gives them a moment to be able to retreat, readjust, and come back. The fourth criteria is compartmentalization. And compartmentalization basically tells us to break spaces down into small, manageable pieces and only allow in those pieces, in those small spaces, what that individual needs to do the task at hand, not to give them too much information and only give them what they need to support what they're learning. The fifth criteria is transition space, and transition space works hand in hand with compartmentalization and spatial sequencing to make sure as we move through our buildings that we move in a way that's smooth and we get an opportunity to adjust, like you coming in from break, we don't dive right into our talk. We give you a moment to adjust back into the new environment that you're in. The sixth criteria is sensory zoning. And as designers and architects, we're classically trained to organize our buildings according to function and utility. So public and private, offices and classrooms, service and served, and so on and so forth. When you're designing for autism, you have to zone your building and organize it around the senses, because that is what the individuals understand. So high stimulation spaces next to high stimulation spaces, and low stimulation next to low stimulation, with good transition in between. And finally, safety, which is something we can never ignore, but particularly for individuals with autism, you need to make sure that there's a high level of safety because of the fear of self-injury, and possible elopement. Just not to get too technical and to give it in layman's terms, this basically tells us that when we design for autism, we need to calm it down, we need to break it down, we need to organize it and sequence it, and allow for space to transition in between those experiences. I'm now working with many schools around the world in the United States, in Saudi Arabia, in the Gulf, and even here in Cairo at the American University, where we hope to create the world's first autism inclusion classroom in a higher education setting. I would like to tell you about another belief that I have, that autism really is just a different way of seeing the world. Different, but not necessarily less than the way we see the world. And if we understand it that way, we can design accordingly. And individuals with autism have the right to have that kind of accommodation. As I once told a faculty member who was hesitant to make some changes in their classroom for a student who was suffering with some of these issues, and he said, just let him tough it out. He should be able to manage. He should be able to handle it. I told him, if you had a student in a wheelchair and your class was up a flight of stairs, 
Would you tell him to tough it out, to manage it, to find a way to get up out of his wheelchair and walk up that flight of stairs to get to your class? Or would you adapt the environment to make it possible for him? And I think the same type of respect needs to be given to individuals with autism. That through our power of design, they have a basic human right to access to the type of design that will help them be able to function in the best way they possibly can. And Aspects Design Index can help us do that. So just to wrap up, I want to bring us back to my first thought. The idea that I believe in the power of design. I believe in the power of design, and I believe that everyone should have equal access to that power so that we can finally create an architecture that really is an architecture for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.